Now as we reflect on God's word, let us pray. O oh Lord, what we've heard from your word awakens us to seek for truth. And Lord, as we reflect on what this word says to us here and now in this day, and in going forward from this day, Lord, help us to hear the truth of your word resonating not only from my lips, but from our lives, from the purpose you call us to in Christ. Lord, hear our prayer offered in his holy name. Amen. It's a nice feeling, knowing. Surprises can be fun and exciting and a great start to a party sometimes. But then there are surprises that come right out of the vast unknown and hurt and can't be helped. And even though we do not know, we could not know they were coming, we can be left with a feeling of shame and frustration and what we didn't anticipate, what we should have known, what we should have seen coming. A person can obsess on trying to cover every contingency, can be ready for any possible outcome, but in our humanity, we have to accept that we cannot anticipate everything. We do our very best, and that is important. And something to acknowledge about Paul's ministry in Athens is that he considers that there is something more going on here that he cannot control. Into that moment, he encounters not the lack of faith or the wrong faith of another, but the possibility that truth could be already resonating in another soul, ready for the moment when it will encounter the gospel as he is about to share it. It is in our nature to understand and to have a search for God. Our nature. We are made in the image of God and in that nature we cannot distinguish ourselves nor recognize ourselves without some understanding of God. In our very nature. As much as we can admire the face who looks back from the mirror or rejoice in the resemblance we see around us in our children or in our families. Our desire to know God is woven into our creation. Our lives yearn for it each day when we wake to seek meaning and purpose and guidance in our first steps or we long for peaceful rest and protection and care in those things, those very human things, we are yearning for God to be in the presence of God. Our church, our church, has become somewhat defensive over the centuries about the right ways and the wrong ways to know God. We have endured the, the hardship of people misusing and misappropriating scripture to serve themselves and not God. We as the church have at times mistaken ourselves as masters of God's word and whether through translation or interpretation or enacting veils of ignorance, we have taken people's yearning for God and the churches have ended up being worshipped in place of God, even to the point of worshipping church buildings. A reckoning on that point has been a long time coming, and this is not the only day and age that we have faced this problem as the church. Even as Peter wrote to the church, he spoke of the, the harm that they were facing. This is not simply an external harm, but the reality and the recognition of our vulnerability and the fact that so much of the harm in our lives comes from our own not knowing and dwelling on the unknown and enacting with the unknown as if we know it already, as if we have all the answers. We are harmed when we do what is wrong 
And while some may call that justice, that same system can harm us for doing what is right. Now, if the only way to avoid what seems harmful, let's say something like shrinking membership in a church, is to do something that is wrong, say, accommodate the faith to suit a less than Christian morality, what is right? That which causes memberships to grow or diminish, or for churches to close and congregations to disperse. And as easy as that question seems so clear to answer, a church without faith is not a church. A church that loses, loosens morality opens the way to many false ways. A church that satisfies truth for money serves money, not God. And you cannot serve both God and money. A church that can only stay open by abandoning God is no longer a church. Great argument. But is that what we are doing? Is that what we represent? Is that what people see and recognize in your practice of Christian faith? Is that what they see as you as a Christian? In the fellowship that you share with other Christians? Is this real enough for you to do something about it? To see your faith lived out in this way? Are they encountering Christ in your life? of faith, in our practice of faith as a community. Paul came up to the Areopagus, to Mars Hill, to the place of discourse and decision where city elders and leaders gathered to enact policy and where trials had taken place and prominent events were planned. It was more than a town square in a city hall, but under Rome, less than a senate. Still, to take a place of prominence and preach would it be for the church to gather together and march down Main Street with banners and floats declaring the passion story. Haven't done that in a while. And all around that place of prominence, there were temples and shrines to that God, that hero, that politician, all from the Greek and Roman pantheon. More than in the face of all that, in the midst of all that, there was a shrine, an altar to the unknown. The unknown God. A real saving grace in that moment, and for these people, was that open door for Paul. Was that they were willing to concede, I don't know. They had a place in their faith for what they did not know. That there could be more than they were recognizing, more than they thought was real. So many people use God as that fill in the blank. When they're unsure about something, ah, God is at work. God is a way of, as, of, of explaining what they cannot understand or, or reuse or refuse to admit. These Greeks and Romans had decided that they, in all the gods that they had constructed for wisdom and war and power and craftsmanship and love and vengeance and nature and messengers and wine and hearth and yes, and they, I can go on for some time, they were having gods for, and heroes for everything, they still said that there might be a god for something else, something we don't know about yet, the unknown god. Paul begins there and affirms their assumption. Imagine if you're doing evangelical work, you're out missioning the community, and you come up with something who everyone says, oh, they've got the wrong idea about God, and the first thing you say to them is, no, you've got something right about God. They're going to listen to you. Paul begins there and affirms their assumption. He says, you're right. There is a God who you didn't know about. Only the God you didn't know about is God. You've been worshiping God in ignorance. That's a hard thing to say to someone. 
You've been worshiping God based on your presumptions. You've been worshiping God to suit your way of seeing God. I'm offering you the opportunity to worship God who is God in the way that God asks his creation to worship him. Before we go out to condemn the world, challenge other world religions, let us begin with the same spirit of grace. Let us begin with the same forgiveness that we experience each time we step away from God. In our own presumption and selfish pride, in our way of unworshipping or not worshipping God. Let's offer the same spirit of teaching and compassion that we witness in Paul. Let me explain to you what you do not know. That's the offer we need to make to the world. Let us offer the understanding that God has given us, the experience, the intimate relationship with God, that empowers our faith. That is what we must share. The authentic, the God as we know God. To help others draw a little closer to God. So much of evangelism begins with, we're right, you're wrong. Be more like us. Let me tell you. Helping a person understand God well enough that they themselves will admit their own fault is far more powerful in offering the gospel, in telling in, in the gospel that's in Christ, than telling them that they're wrong and getting into an argument over who's right and who's wrong. Even when you prove yourself right, and I doubt you will can. If you do prove yourself right, I doubt you will convince many to believe what you believe in the end. Because you've only proved yourself right. Let God prove God is right. And you stand as God's emissary of grace. The friend that is ready to embrace them when they come before God saying, Yes, Lord. Paul, in his own grace and his awareness of the culture to which he was speaking, goes so far as to quote pagan poets, Greek poet uh, Epimenides and Sicilian Aratus. Just as we might make a quote of a popular phrase of common wisdom or a, a favorite pop song to make our point, to be able to speak the language the cultural language, the personal language of the people to whom we're sharing the gospel. What we might be compelled to learn and appreciate about them, and in doing so, what grace we show, what door we open. We don't come in ignorant of who they are. We come in knowing them to offer them a relationship with God who knows them better than we do. At the very least, we're encountering another point of view on God. And we can grow and learn from that as well. People today know that Christians, people who say they're Christians, worship God. They might have heard about Jesus, though they probably slur his name in their common speech. They likely have no comprehension of what the Holy Spirit is. So what they will come to know and encounter and comprehend about God, the unknown God to them, will come through the tact and the wisdom and the grace and the understanding with which we will again, in this new age, in which we will again share the good news. You're not alone in this. 
For Christ has promised us that the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, will be with us in especially this, that even as we are compelled to speak into the lives of others and grow and be disciplined among ourselves, so we may even face hardships and persecutions, trials, but we will never be alone in moments of trial or of witness to the truth that is in Christ. So in trusting God, we do not need to speak the truth and must not speak the truth in anger or malice to prove the case or as a means to prove someone wrong. Our goal is not to go out into the world and prove them wrong, but to share Christ who is right. And spoken in love, the truth becomes self-evident. And it is God who is glorified above all. And the unknown becomes the known, and the sadness becomes joy, and the waiting is over, and the hope is fulfilled. May God's praise resonate in all you come to say and do in his name and for his glory's sake.